it is good to, to have all of you with us. We have a growing audience that's developing uh, online in our study of Ezekiel. I'm getting an amazing number of requests for workbooks as uh, folks are finding the study and tuning into that. And we appreciate that so very, very much as well. And hope that we're able to think about some things of a spiritual nature as Ezekiel delivered his message to the exiles as they were along the river Chebar over in Babylon, having been carried away from their homeland. And there's some pretty profound points that we're going to be noticing even this evening. And the parallels to today are indeed amazing. We're going to be looking at the sixth lesson in, in our workbooks this evening. And he's going to be addressing a problem that is rampant even in our own day. And I hope that we'll be able to, to draw some, some uh, instruction from, from that. I had a little girl come the other day, I was substitute teaching, and, and she came in and, and you know, she was one of these that uh, she sometimes works and sometimes she'd rather talk. And, and she came in and she was just all, all bubbly. She said, do you know that Jesus is coming back and he is going to beat the devil and he is going to sit on the throne and rule the world from Jerusalem and then one day the devil is going to be released for a little season and then he is going to beat him again and take everybody to heaven. And I go, oh, really? And there was another kid in the class. And, yeah, and politics play into that too. And she said, what's politics? And he's, well, that's the decisions the governments make. And, and that is also going to show us something about all this coming to pass. And I thought, these are kids that are hardly out of elementary school. And yet they've been obviously pretty well schooled in some of the doctrines of men that we would challenge in terms of looking to what the verses of Scripture actually say. And the wonder comes up, where did all that come from? Well, it's a situation very similar to what Ezekiel had to deal with. As Ezekiel lived his rather bizarre life, as we have noticed so far, for a period of time he had to live on bread and water. We noticed that he had to sleep from certain positions and there were all kinds of other things that God did to him and with him to attract the attention of Israel to make them want, why is he doing that? And it gave him a platform then to help instruct them about the right ways of God. But as he talked to the people about what God had said he was going to do, and about his judgments against Israel and why they were in captivity in the first place, there were a whole host of other prophets, other teachers around, who were saying Ezekiel doesn't know what he's talking about. That Ezekiel's words have no merit. Let me tell you the way it's really going to be. And they filled the heads of the people with all kinds of various false doctrines. We have the same type of thing that goes on today. But as you stand before audiences and say, let's open our Bibles and read and see exactly what the Word of God says, there's a whole host of people who will be in other localities saying, it's not that way at all. Now, talking about baptism for the remission of sins, yet, in some quarters, you don't even have to be baptized. You know, just accept Jesus into your heart and everything's going to be fine. Or the idea of worshiping God is kind of an extravaganza that we put together on the weekends. And it's really a good show. You need to come see it. The music is fabulous and we have such a wonderful time together. May even have a meal after church is over. And we've got all these wonderful things planned. And that's where you need to come to have a good time. And on and on the stories go. And it's not to ridicule in the light of making fun. It's the idea of with soberness realizing that many people are being led and taught and confused by individuals who haven't got an understanding of God's word. And sometimes, I won't make a blanket accusation, but sometimes, just as in Ezekiel's day, they have a hidden agenda as to why they would teach and practice what they do 
Sometimes it's for financial gain. Sometimes it has other motivations for control. But Ezekiel is trying to get the attention of the people to say, look, you have sinned. And as a result of this sin, you are in captivity and God expects you to repent. But that lesson was not conveniently received by many people. And so there were other prophets saying, I am a prophet of God. And let me tell you the way it's really going to be. Now Ezekiel, he has all this doomsday material and and Ezekiel's telling you that you've got to repent and make changes, but let me tell you the way it's really going to be. And with smooth words and fair speeches, as Paul said, they deceive the hearts of the simple. Now as you look at our workbook study here in, in uh, Lesson 6, we find that there were some strategies given by God to Israel back through the years to help them understand that you can soon figure out who is teaching truth and who is teaching error. The author of our workbook uses one, a couple of phrases that were kind of new to me to, to address this, but they're pretty easily defined, I think. And he said one of the things that would help determine whether a prophet was a legitimate prophet or not, was what he calls the test of agreement. What is the test of agreement? If the prophecy doesn't align with the word of God, then there are false prophets. All right. For example, if we went back under the law of Moses and we looked at one of the commands, Let's say the one that says, thou shalt not steal. But then a prophet came along and said, well, yeah, I know we're not supposed to steal. But if the situation really gets dire and bad, and if it's the difference between you're starving to death or not, then there's really nothing wrong in you filching something from somebody else. It would all be okay. Well, that's taking the law of God and saying there's exceptions to it. That's taking the law of God and saying it really doesn't apply. And here is another alternative. The idea of the test of agreement here is, is just uh, as Keith mentioned. The prophecies that were being given must be consistent with the word of God or with the law. Isaiah said it this way in Isaiah chapter 8 and uh, going down to, to verse 20. He said... To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. We can go back up to verse 19. He says, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that, uh, that peep and that mutter. Should not a people seek unto their God for the living, uh, uh, for the living to the dead? And so in other words, there's always these people who have alternative strategies here is what i can we can talk to the dead here are other things and this is the the revelation that's been given to me and isaiah simply says here in verse 20 if they speak not according to this word it's because there's no light in them but nonetheless the teaching happens day in and day out both in our day as well as in the days of the exile in question two, we use another phrase to talk about a litmus test as to whether a prophet was actually speaking correctly or not. And he calls it the test of providence. What was that? The way prophet uh, prophesied that what he predicted came to pass. Okay. That was what he, he, the prophecy was saying. If, if this prophet says it's going to be like this, and then it doesn't turn out that way, then that prophet's the false prophet. This isn't a percentage thing. Where if you're, if you're accurate 75% of the time, that makes you a good, faithful prophet of God. If you are a prophet of God, what you're saying is true every single time. Especially here with the prophecies of the day in which they were, many of the prophecies were a foretelling of something that was going to come to pass. 
Remember we talked about this at length with Jeremiah, how that he was telling them that the Babylonians were coming, that the city was going to be destroyed, and that if they would surrender, for example, if you would surrender to the Babylonians, Jerusalem will not be burned. Well, the leaders of the government in Jerusalem decided that, oh, no, no, we've got to, we will we, we put Jeremiah in prison. Don't let him spread that kind of, of false uh, teaching because that will weaken the hearts of the people and they won't fight and resist the Babylonians like we want them to. And so they did not follow his advice. And as a result, the Babylonians did sack the city and burn it to the ground. But there were a lot of prophets that were saying, oh, no, no, the Babylonians aren't even going to come. That the Babylonian army is not even going to get here. And whenever they do get here, we'll be able to, to talk them out of doing any damage. And there won't be. And so they were doing their best to make everybody believe that it was all going to be okay. But Jeremiah's prophecies were the ones that truly did come to pass. Those were the measures of the true prophets of God. They spoke the truth, and the truth bore up even under scrutiny of the times that would unfold as time went along. But those prophecies must be fulfilled. They had to come to pass if you are a faithful prophet of God. And the author gave some examples. One of them was of the prophet Micaiah, and he wound up in a position of where he was called before King Ahab, to give some prediction as to what was going to happen in an upcoming battle. Now, there had been many prophets of, of Baal that had told Ahab, everything's going to be fine. You're going to be victorious. You're going to drive the enemies away, and Israel is going to be saved, and your name is going to be glorified. But what did Micaiah say? It's not going to happen. Not only are you going to lose the battle, but what did he say about Ahab personally? You're going to die. And so, here you've got two sets of voices. Those saying, go for it. You're a great king. You have a mighty army. You're smart in battle. You're going to win. And then you have this singular prophet of God over here saying, no. God has said, not only are you going to lose the battle, but you're going to lose your life. And of course, it came to pass exactly as Micaiah said that it would. An archer shot an arrow almost at random, but it found a chink in Ahab's armor. It struck him, and he died. So the prophet knew what he was talking about. You see, the true prophet of God. But as Ahab was riding in his chariot going out to the battle, he had the assurance by hundreds of prophets of Baal that you are going to come back from this a victor and that you are going to be somebody really special. But all of what they said were lies. Another example that the author cited was the story of Hananiah and the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah was trying his best to reason with the leaders in Jerusalem and to help them understand that the city of Jerusalem was doomed because of their sin. And Hananiah was one of the ringleaders in persecuting Jeremiah because he did not want to embrace the things that Jeremiah said and he thought that Jeremiah was just kind of a cancer in town. He's the one always saying, you're going to lose. You need to surrender. Uh, you need to repent. You need to get right with God. God is the one that can help you. And they didn't want to hear that because they had other idols all over the city and they were worshiping those idols. They were even worshiping some of the Babylonian gods, hoping that they'd be able to talk them into helping them survive this battle with Nebuchadnezzar. And finally, Jeremiah had basically suffered enough. And what did Jeremiah say and what actually happened to prove the truthfulness of Jeremiah's comments? What was going to happen to Hananiah? He was going to die. In fact, Jeremiah said that you're going to die within the year. And seven months later, 
Hananiah was dead. What the prophet said came to pass. So once again, the test of providence is, about, is validated. It proves that Jeremiah was the one who knew what he was, was talking about. Because of all of the false prophecies, the unreliability of what so many of the prophets said, by the time that Amos comes on the scene, as uh, uh, in question five, what was the reputation of prophets uh, during Amos's day? They had a rotten reputation because they were looked at as a bunch of liars. They were looked upon as charlatans and opportunists. They said whatever made people happy. And Amos did not even want to be numbered with them. He didn't want to be considered one of the in crowd of prophets because many of them were speaking such perverse things. So as we look at, at a couple of, of uh, passages out of the, the book of Ezekiel and also as a, a very parallel passage to it over in uh, uh, the book of, of Jeremiah, we find that this same problem of false teachers and people trying to undermine the effectiveness of the teaching of the prophets of God, um, both of these passages are given to us uh, to deal with the claims of the, the false prophets and what it was that they had to say and how that that material was not going to be the things that would truly be, shall we say, worth listening to because these individuals were not speaking truth. They were not guiding people the right way. Let's look over at Ezekiel chapter uh, 13 and the first uh, few verses there. It says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy, and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts, Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither have made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen vanity and lying divinations, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them, and have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. They have not seen a vain vision, and they have not spoken a lying divination, uh, divination. whereas ye say, The Lord saith it, albeit have I not spoken? So what he goes on to say here, as you continue reading, is that he is calling out these false prophets for the fact that they're saying things that simply are not true. He calls them foolish prophets. They're making up their stories. I, can, I still remember vividly, years ago, there was a televangelist who was trying to, to raise money for his newest pet project and he said the Lord has revealed it to me that we need to and he said I was reading through my Bible and I was there in the book of Hebrews and it says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is and God just enlightened me and said I was supposed to build a theme park and there's supposed to be a great big hotel here. And it's going to be a place where Christians can all come together and be able to worship God and be encouraged in spiritual things. God told me this. And people started sending in the money. And they started trying to build the Praise the Lord theme park. Eventually, he wound up in jail for the way in which it was exposed that he defrauded so many people. But nonetheless, that was his claim. And oh, he made it passionately, and, and, and I've got a verse to base it on, and God just given me this insight, and, and I just know that this is what we need to do. And it was not true. And that's the kind of climate that we find ourselves dealing with in, in this situation. Notice a couple of... Uh, uh, other passages that uh, link into this, if we go to question 7, 
It says, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, and ye shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. Here God is telling Ezekiel to hang on. <laughs> as you teach the truth, as you explain the way things are supposed to be, what is often going to be the public reaction to the things that you have to tell them? What's going to be the public reaction from Ezekiel chapter 2? As he's talking about it here, he's saying, this is what kind of a nation? They're rebellious. They're a rebellious nation. They don't want to listen. They don't want to hear what you have to say. Some few might, but many will simply tune you out and just feel like you're something that they have to forbear and put up with. But he said, one day they're going to look back and they're going to truly understand there was a prophet in Israel. To me, the sadness is thinking of the number of people who will be carried all the way into Judgment Day. And they're going to be the ones talked about in Matthew chapter 7, where to them it's going to be surprising when the Lord rejects them. Lord, you know, uh, haven't we done many you know, wonderful things in your name? And, and in your name we've cast out devils. And in your name done many wonderful works, you know. We were right in the thick of it, Lord. And we were just so concerned about so many things. And what's he going to say? Yeah, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So just because there is the passionate gleam in the eye, and just such a dedicated effort to say that it's right with God, that doesn't make it so. And for a lot of people, that really is more of the litmus test. If I like what is being said, I like the people who are saying it, and it seems to be pleasing to my ears, this is going to be fun, this is going to be a new experience, and so surely God's going to bless this because it's being done in the name of the Lord. Whether or not Bible authority exists is besides the it's what I like, it sounds good, so let's do it. And to get all the way to the day of judgment and then to be rejected, but the Lord saying, I never knew you. Because as Jesus said in the prior verse, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but who will? He that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. That's the bottom line. Any other comments as we go through here? You know, it is a, a, a regrettable kind of, of situation. Uh, going back to, to Ezekiel 14 and going down to, to verse 4 beginning, uh, here we find in, in uh, question 8, he talks about where these people's head really would, could, be, could be found, so to speak. Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart because they are all estranged from me uh, through their idols. Therefore saith the house of the Lord, thus saith the Lord God, repent and turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. So the problem is you have your head set on what you want. You have your idol. You have what you want to do. And you are so attuned to the things that you want to do that it becomes a stumbling block whenever somebody presents the truth to you. It's the Everything that you look at is through the eyes of the idols that you've created. And you won't just clear things away and listen to the truth of God and do it, you're following your own abominations. The things that you think are cool, the things that you think are, are right. So, in question nine, what would be the main appeal of these false prophets? That's exactly right. They tickled the ears of the people. He, they told the people what they wanted to hear. I think the author uses the, the phrase that they, they presented rosy scenarios of good outcomes instead of telling the truth. 
we'll say whatever we need to say to make people happy, to make people think that, that they are really wonderful on the right track and doing good things. You have the seeds of greatness in you. And God has wonderful things in store for you. And God's got this. Or, and, and to a measure, that's true. But the way in which it is sometimes carried forth is the idea that you're going to be blessed of God because you've got those seeds of greatness in you regardless of what you do. Even if you fail to repent. Even if you fail to do to obey the things God's commanded, you're still going to have a wonderful life, and God's going to bless you because those are just elements of doctrine that we really need to talk about anyway. And so just realize that God's on your side and He wants you to be great because I don't want you to feel bad. I don't want to talk about sin and repentance because that will make you feel bad. And I don't want you to feel bad. So the tone of their presentation is all love and roses instead of an actual addressing the context of what God had said. In question 10, how do the words of Ezekiel 2, 12, 27 relate to the false prophets and their approach to the prophecies of doom for, for Israel? They found a way to explain what Ezekiel said and to take the teeth out of it. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 12 and going down to, to verse 27. He said, Son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel say, The vision that he seeth is for many days to come, and he prophesieth of the times that are far off. What was the way that they tried to discredit the things that the prophet said? You. Yeah, this won't affect you. This doesn't have anything to do with you or your changes. You know, because this is for other generations, another time, another place. You know, we're dealing here with today and the real and the now. And, you know, the things that, that Ezekiel says, we're not going to say he's wrong. We're not going to say he's a liar and that he's misrepresenting anything. It's just that he has the wrong context. He, he's making you feel like it's going to happen in your generation, and really it's not going to happen for years on down the road. So, in the meantime, let's tell you what, let me tell you what you need to do. It's the idea of trying to get people to discount and discredit truth. And we have the same thing today. You present straight from the Word of God what it says, and folks will say, well, you know, that's that's your truth. But I, I've got my truth over here. And, and I see it this way. And so you keep your truth and I'll hold on to my truth and I'll meet you in heaven. Not so. But that is the way in which sometimes we try to dilute that which is, is uh, actually taught of God. In question 11, he said, Ezekiel calls the false prophets foolish. In the 13th chapter and going down to verse 3 there, he said, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. The word there that's translated foolish is, is a pretty deep Hebrew, Hebrew word that carries a whole lot more with it than kind of accidentally making wrong judgment. But rather, it kind of goes back to, you know, the, the word actually could be associated with the idea of Nabal, who was the first husband to, uh, to Abigail. And, you know, it said he was a churlish fellow. He was a jerk. Whenever David's men came asking for food, he treated them shamefully, refused to give them anything. He accused them of uh, probably trying to, to, to steal something for themselves. You know, he was just crude in a lot of, of different ways, and it wasn't long till, till God struck him dead. Well, the word here, foolish, could be the idea of being spiritually and morally insensitive. They were blasphemers. They were arrogant. They were immoral. Um, they weren't just kind of taking important things and treating them flippantly. There was a method to their madness. They taught for their own gain. They were blasphemers against the truth. They could not be touched with the truth because they were too smart for that. They were so arrogant in their knowledge of how things were going to be as they said it. 
Many individuals today will hide behind education the same way. I have a doctorate degree in divinity. And you're telling me, I had a friend of mine years ago, went to a denominational revival in the neighborhood and heard this fellow talk about salvation. All you have to do is accept Jesus into your heart. And so after it was over, he and the friend that went with him said, can we talk to you for a second? And they went up to, to reason with the guy. And and he was talking about the idea that, uh, that, that baptism was just not going to do anything towards your salvation. It was just, you know, you have to accept Jesus into your heart. And they said, well, Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That kind of sounds like baptism is important. And Ananias told Saul of Tarsus to arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on... And he puffed up, he said, and you, I've been preaching for 20, 30, 40 years. I have a degree in divinity. In fact, I have a doctorate in divinity. And you're trying to tell me what the Word of God has to say? And I've seen that done over and over again. Individuals pretending that they've got some kind of hotline to God because they've read out of certain books and sat at the feet of certain teachers. And truth is truth and error is error. And if it doesn't match up with what the book says, somebody's wrong. And we've got to have that awareness. What did we say that from question 12, how did Ezekiel compare these prophets, false prophets? He called them what? Foxes in the desert because of their cunning ways to try to deceive people. In question 13, what did Ezekiel say about the ultimate fate of these prophets? They were going to perish with their lies. It was going to catch up with them and they were going to be held accountable for what they did. Question 14, what was the effect of the preaching of the false prophets upon the righteous? When you're trying to do what's right and you're surrounded by all of this false teaching and we experience it today, what kind of effect does it have on you? You get kind of disheartened. You're trying to say what's right and no one seems to want to listen. It becomes rather discouraging. <clears throat> it disheartens the righteous from, their, from repentance and striving to do any better. I'm just going to, you know, it doesn't make any difference anyway. And then what does it do for the wicked? Whenever you have all the false teachers saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace, what does that do? They believe it. It gives them the courage to keep right on doing the sinful things that they've been doing. There's no reason to change. And so the last uh, question, uh, question 16, it says, They have seduced my people, saying, Peace when there is no peace. And because when the people build a wall, these prophets smear, the old King James says, untempered mortar. But my grandmother used to call it whitewash. And you'd use the whitewash. To, to, it always amazed me as a kid growing up. She'd whitewash the basis of trees about halfway up or something like that. You know, whitewash used to be the thing to, to use. And um, that's what the prophets would do. They would make it all sound good. Do what you want to do. It's all going to be fine. It's all going to be fun. And there's not going to be any consequence for your error. And so Ezekiel had to deal with that in his day just as we have to deal with it in ours. Individuals today oftentimes do not rightly divide the words of truth. There's a lot of folks who fail to understand that we, the Old Testament was a very important set of laws for the Jewish nation. That's what made them God's peculiar people. But with the death of Christ, those laws were done away with, and we now are under the law of Christ. In Colossians uh, chapter 2, and going down to verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, that which was against us and which contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. But even though the Old Testament law was abolished through the death of Christ. We did not have to offer animal sacrifices anymore. 
we were not restricted to the kind of diet that the Jews had to eat. And now Gentiles would have a right to the tree of life. But yet in Acts chapter 15, the first century church had a problem with folks who were Jewish converts saying that you still have to keep elements of the law of Moses. You've got to practice the, the right of circumcision. You've got to follow the law of Moses or you can't be saved. And so to their mindset, being a Christian was like being a Pharisee, a Sadducee, or a Christian. It was the new evangelistic wing of the Jewish religion where you could go out and talk to others and bring them in, but, but once you brought them in, you had to Judaize them and make them like we've always been. And the Apostle Paul withstood Peter and others about that kind of decision-making that wasn't the way it was. Whenever we start talking with folks today about how to become a Christian, we can go to the Old Testament prophecies that predicted the coming of Jesus, all the wonderful things that were going to happen through the Messiah, but we have to encourage them to keep on studying and to do as Philip did with the Ethiopian eunuch. He was reading from Isaiah 53 about a man that was going to be offered for the sins of the people. And through his stripes, we're going to be cleansed. And I say, who is he talking about? Himself or some other man? And it says that Philip began at that same scripture and preached unto him Jesus in Acts chapter 8. The eunuch had to study a little deeper. He had to realize that there was more to it than reading the, just the words of Isaiah. What was the actual application of that? And so that's why we encourage people today to take their Bibles and to study more deeply. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that he does not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the words of truth. As we've talked about tonight, the false prophets in Ezekiel's day are parallel to the false teachers that we have in ours. And the only way that you're going to be able to differentiate between the people who are telling it to you straight and individuals who are twisting it is if you have an understanding of what the verses say. We find that we're going to have to have that desire, as Peter talked about it in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, to be as newborn babes that desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And so we start feeding on the word of God seeing what it actually says and then we're equipped whenever you hear some of this noise john said over in first john chapter 4 and verse 1 beloved believe not every spirit but try or test the spirits whether they be of god because many false prophets are gone out into the world as we've noticed in our lesson tonight the things that are being taught, does it match up with the Word of God? Not just some of the time, but does it match up with the Word of God all of the time? See, that's the problem for many people. As Ezekiel talked about Israel having their idols and they saw everything through the eyes of the idol, there are many people who have a certain allegiance to a religious heritage and as long as some of it's right, even though verses are supplied to them that say, wait a minute now, these certain religious practices are not authorized in the word of God. Can you show me where the church in the first century did this? And they can, but that's okay because, and so they hold on to these traditions instead of being able to surrender them and say, wait a minute. If that's not what God's commanded, I don't need to be doing it. I need to obey exactly what the scriptures say. And so whenever Paul told the Corinthians to come out from among them and be as separate, and touch not the unclean thing, he said, you've got to be able to make some of these distinctions. 
We've got to be able to realize error and have the courage to walk away from it and to see what God has commanded and say, that's what I'm going to do. And that's what we plead with people to do. Week after week after week, in the lessons that we broadcast, the things that we talk about here, let's just follow the Bible pattern in all things. Make sure that we have book, chapter, and verse for all of it. As Paul said in Colossians 3, whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of or by the authority of Jesus Christ. Where's the verses for that? And it doesn't need to be, it can't be one of those compromising situations. That's what Ezekiel was condemning in his day. They say, peace, peace, because right now, things are kind of peaceful. He said, but there is no peace. Because there's too much sin going on. Too many things that need to be fixed. There's too many things where you need to make changes in your life. And it's not pleasant to have to talk about such straightforward topics and say certain things that are maybe even commonly accepted in our society are condemned in God's word as being sinful. But if we're going to speak as the oracles of God, that's what we've got to say. Say it with love. Try to be as, as patient and long-suffering as you can be. But sin is still sin. And it's got to be addressed and fixed if we're going to be right in the sight of God. The scriptures teach us what to do to be right in the sight of God, to be able to be freed from a past of sinfulness if we believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we're willing to repent of our sins, confess our faith in Christ, and be baptized for the remission of those sins that sinful past is gone. And we rise to walk, as Paul said in Romans 6, in newness of life. And then as we live each day, we're challenged in our decision making. Sometimes we don't get it right. And sometimes we make mistakes. But John tells us in 1 John chapter 1, that if we'll confess our faults, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But it comes with our realizing sin is wrong, things are wrong, and I'm going to do what's right. Tonight, if there's some steps you need to take to make your life right in the sight of God, either being baptized for the mission of your sins or coming back if you've strayed away, if there's some way we can help you, won't you come? As together we stand and as we sing.